Hey guys, David here and welcome to this video. So today we're gonna have a look at the Prusa i3 Mark III, the original version, not all the Chinese copies. And what all the smart features can do and if it maybe is too smart. And I'm also gonna compare it to my CR10, which I've tricked out a little bit, but it's still mostly a CR10. So the reason I went out and bought a Prusa i3 is because I just wanted a really reliable machine that was gonna run pretty much no matter what. I just pressed the start button and it runs. And so far my experience has been just that. I got the kit version because why not sell it for a couple hundred bucks and assembling it wasn't that bad. The instruction manual is extremely good. It's fully printed, hard copy, colored with extremely detailed steps. And like, if you can assemble a Lego set, you can assemble this printer. It's gonna take maybe like a weekend or I just did it over a couple of evenings. In total, it took me like five hours, but I also already have some experience assembling 3D printers. And then the really great thing is with the Prusa printer, just the software support for it. The first time you plug the printer in after you've assembled it, instead of just turning on and just being there, it knows that it's the first time and it kind of greets you, it says hello to you and then it goes through a calibration process where first it checks if you assembled everything correctly and in my case there was actually a cable in the way and it sensed that the x-axis wasn't quite as long to travel as it should be and the way it knows all these beautiful things is through the really intelligent electronics. The stepper motor drivers aren't just any dumb Chinese drivers. They're original trinamic drivers and they can sense exactly how much current the motors are pulling and using that information it can st detect stuff like skipped steps but it can also detect when it's running into things. So instead of having limit switches the carriage just moves to the, to the ends and when it hits the plastic it knows it instantly and it stops and that way it can know exactly how long it is and you can make use of all the travel. And after I fixed this little error with the cable being in the way, then it measured it again and said, okay now. And then it measured the bed and the hot end, just to make sure that everything is plugged in correctly and is responding. After that, it went into a bit of a longer probing routine where it basically made sure that everything is square to each other. It touched off a bunch of different points on the build plate and calibrated the bed leveling sensor and all that good stuff and after like 15 minutes or so of auto calibration it was ready uh, to start printing. Now one other thing you have to adjust before you can start printing and it also prompts you for that is the just the z-axis offset. It does have a probe to measure how far it is off the table but that's mostly just a relative measurement. So you just run this calibration wizard and you adjust the height with the with little wheel on the controller until the line that is extruded looks great. And all these steps are also detailed in the handbook, which is also just another such great value that comes with your printer. Even I have learned quite a few things out of that handbook and I've been 3D printing for like five years. So it really is a great handbook, it guides you through all the steps from complete beginner to knowing how to use your machine. And then on the included SD cards there are also quite a few already pre-sliced programs and what I also really like just a little thing is that they put the time into the title of all the projects. So I printed out quite a few of them just to kind of see what the printer does from the factory and I was really impressed. The prints basically came out perfect. There were no artifacts or nothing that I would expect on something like the CR10, but this just worked out of the box. Then for the next step I downloaded their version of Slick 3R, which is also really quite good. You have a bunch of preset uh, profiles for all different materials and some different qualities. And so far I actually didn't have to tune any of the profiles. The ones that were provided worked just fine. So I printed mostly at 0.15 millimeters as that's the recommended setting, 
but you can go down as low as 0.05 millimeters or up as far as like 0.3 millimeters. And thanks to the genuine E3D hot end and the nice heated bed, it can also go up really far and you can print almost every material that is out there. Of course, if you want an enclosure to print ABS and stuff like that even better, you would have to add that separately. But the heated bed easily gets up to like 100, 120 degrees Celsius. So that's not an issue at all. And speaking of the extruder, I also really like how they're using the design from Bontech for the extruder itself with the two gears that both engage to the filament. This means that there is much less uh, losing filament traction as instead of having just the bearing and a gear that puts the filament down, it has gears on both sides, which just is so much better in my opinion. And I don't know why not more printers are using that. Now let's talk about some of the smart features. As I've already mentioned, the motors know when you're running into the end stops, so that's how they calibrate. And in the beginning of the print, the first couple of times it's kind of surprising, it just basically rams it into the side uh, a couple of times to get a good sense of where the zero point is. And of course there is bed leveling that it's gonna do before every print, which is really fast and it is using the probe for that instead of just the motor, which I guess is a bit more precise and also doesn't mean that you have to ram the hot end into the build plate every time. But during printing, it can also detect stuff like when it's running out of filament. This actually happened to me once, like I did it on purpose, and it just, when it runs out of filament, it notices, it puts a message on the screen, it pauses the print, moves off to the side, keeps the build plate heated so that your print doesn't pop off, and just waits till you tell it to remove the filament and then put in the new one. And then it just continues like there was nothing and you really can't tell at all that there ever was a pause. Now, the problem with that is that it also once detected it when the filament didn't run out. It just stopped the print. It was overnight, so in the morning I didn't even know what it was. It was just beeping and telling me to remove the filament. Later I checked in the error log and it met was that the thought that the film had run out. Now, it didn't happen ever since that and I've printed quite a bit more. You can see this big Skyrim dragon skull. This was about like 72 hours of printing and it never happened there again. So it might have been just a one-time thing, but I don't know. You can also, of course, disable that in the settings. And provided you're running into the, in the normal mode, in not the quiet mode, it can also detect stuff when it gets caught. Like, when you have print and there's a little part sticking up for whatever reason and the print head rabbits over it, there's a chance it gets caught there and skips some steps. And supposedly, this printer would also notice that and automatically correct it. Now, there's no real easy way to test that and I didn't ever have that issue. Also, the stepper motors, they're really strong, so I tried to stop the print head during printing to test it and it has quite a lot of power. Now I just mentioned quiet mode and let's talk a bit more about that. Even in the normal mode, this printer, compared to other 3D printers, is really quiet. And considering that it's completely open like that, with no enclosure whatsoever, that is very impressive. But once you turn the stealth mode on, then... Well, I've seen it on videos before, but until I've seen it in person, it's like... It just moves, and the only thing you're hearing is the bearings on the steel rods, just ever so quietly rolling over there and basically nothing else. There might be a, a ever so slight hissing from the motors every once in a while, but it's basically silent. 
of course, once the part cooling fan turns on, you can hear that quietly, but it's no louder than my computer. When that's like very, very impressive. But I do recommend that you turn off quiet mode if you're printing overnight and you're not in the same room because it does give less power to the motors, which increases your chance of a failed print. I never had any issues with it, but I basically only turn it on when I'm in the room next to it and just want it to be quieter. Apart from all these convenience features, let's look at some of the cold hard truth. How well does it print? And if you look at some of these prints, it prints really well. It, the models for the most part come out just how they are in the slicer preview. It just does everything nicely, there's no, not much ringing, there are no other real artifacts. And the only times where it starts struggling is when basically just the limitation of the 3D printing technology uh, come into play. Like this red part here, it didn't print perfectly and like I didn't expect it to print perfectly. It has very very long, very thin parts that just while printing only from the bed moving back and forth they move around and the extruder putting down material on it also just moves it around a, li a little bit and that's why it has this kind of ugly underside. But compared to the one that I pr have printed in the CR10 in the past it looks a little bit better. Now I could tweak that a little bit by slowing down the speeds a bit which are by default for my taste rather high which is good because the print completes faster but you can also dial those down a little bit and get some I guess more accuracy. But then other prints like this uh, Skyrim Dragon Skull uh, which I printed in multiple parts printed totally fine. There was however one slight issue and I didn't expect that issue at all. It is the build plate. It is quite handy to have this removable magnetic build plate. It also has a coating on it which makes the prints stick on it very well and in the end after the print is done you can just take it off and pop the prints off. But it is not 100% even. I'm used to printing on a sheet of glass or a mirror and that is just perfectly flat. It might be a little bit skewed to one side and that but on my issue was that it had just some slight kind of almost waves in it and while with the, thanks to all the bed leveling and all that good stuff if you're just printing display models that's perfectly fine and you're not even gonna notice that but where I did notice it was when I had some quite large contact areas in the middle of this print and it just didn't match up perfectly although both of them were sitting on the belt plate that's just something to watch out for. Maybe you can kind of compensate for that or do something. I haven't dove into it that deeply, uh, but it just seems kind of surprising that on this printer, this build plate would be an issue. One other quick thing I want to mention about the build plate is that there are different versions. What I have is the smooth sheet and I actually prefer that over the powder coated one. Now, I've heard that the prints do stick a little bit better to the powder coated version of it, but the underside of the print gets really kind of a rough texture. You can see that on the prints of the printer itself, they were printed on the powder coated version of the bed, and I don't like that underside as much. I prefer the smoother underside, which you get from the smooth sheet. But that's just something that you will have to decide on while ordering. And one other kind of criticism I do have for the printer is that at $800 pretty much, having just this tiny little LCD screen like just any other cheaper printer is not that nice. Even some quite inexpensive Chinese printers nowadays have touchscreen LCDs that are colorful and have nice menus, which on this printer I would almost expect. Now, I know it is because they're using an 8-bit board and what they are doing with this 8-bit board is really impressive. And if you look at the board itself, it is completely jam-packed full of stuff. And it is really nice. It works way better than most 32-bit boards, I would say. But for a Mark IV, I would hope that they move to 32-bit so that they can add stuff like 
a colored LCD touchscreen, which would just make the whole experience a little bit nicer. Also, the same design, which was the same since the first generation, it works. It works really well, but it isn't all that nice. If the goal is for this printer to be something that you can just put anywhere, you can put it in an office or a living room of a normal person, then this design doesn't really speak to that. It is very industrial looking with everything exposed and open and while the dangerous parts are protected, having an enclosure around it or just at least all the parts a little bit more closed off would make it a little bit more mainstream ready. So in conclusion, I would say this is the best possible printer that you can make with this kind of design. If you wanted to improve on that, you need to either upgrade kind of an enclosure and other parts around it, or you need to move to a 32-bit board to have other more convenience features. But for what it is, this printer gets a big thumbs up from me and I can highly recommend it if it is within your price range. And I do also recommend for most people to get the kit version. Only if you're just a complete newbie and have no clue about putting screws together, then maybe not, but otherwise the kit is really quite simple to assemble. So it is a nice exercise to kind of learn about your printer while you've been building it and you can also save a couple hundred dollars. So that's it for this video. If you liked it, please leave a like down below and also consider to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. I also have Twitter and Instagram linked down below where you can check out what I'm doing. And that's it. Thanks for watching and until next time.